My job is amazing. I feel like I'm crafting all day. Um, I make jump ropes for wholesale customers and I lead a whole team in doing so. People aren't gonna know this, most likely, but your life has made the news a few times, which not a lot of people can talk about. Maybe that's not something to like be super fired up about because of why, right? But, yeah. so, okay. so tell us about Rayana. Um, Rayana is my eight-year-old, and um, when she was six years old, we were staying at her grandma's house in Rock Island, and um, I left her with her grandma and went into town for some pizza, and I got a phone call that uh, she had an accident. Scared out of my mind. I didn't know what had happened. It was a serious phone call. Nobody told me. I got there and saw caution tape around the pond and still not knowing for sure um, what had happened, I assumed she fell into the pond. And so um, I was drove to the emergency room. About 93 minutes later, they let me into her room and had told me that she had drowned, um, were giving me supports to reach out to people who had gone through losing children. Um, she was ice cold and I was told she needed to be life flown to Seattle Children's. And so I um, was pregnant at the time and I had my 12 year old son and not everybody could go. So um, Ballard Ambulance was gracious enough to drive us to Seattle Children's and the, the city was gracious enough to come up with $300 on the spot to help us take care of each other there. And um, it was a long journey. It was about three months in the hospital. She recovered fully, no, no brain damage, no disabilities, no anything like that. Um, yeah. Well, time out. So yeah. she, you got to, the, you went to the hospital. There's 93 like so minutes much. later, you were told she drowned. How is it possible for someone to have drowned for an hour and a half, right? Hour and a half later and still be alive? Like, that doesn't actually make sense. You were told she died. By God's grace is the only answer I have for that. She was underwater for 20 minutes. Um, it took them 93 minutes to get her heartbeat back. And when it came back, it was uh, very light. Um, they had to put the tube down her throat for breathing. Uh -huh. She was on a breathing machine for most of her stay in the hospital, but it was by God's grace that she survived. She's a miracle. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. She literally was dead. Yeah, she died twice actually. The what second time she was um, recovering in the hospital, she went downhill. Um, she ended up having lung issues. Um, she coded while I was in the room with her that time. And I heard the code go over the speaker, but I didn't realize it was her until everybody had surrounded her bed and had to start doing CPR on her again. Um, and again, by God's grace, she survived that one too. Um, she had a blood clot bigger than the surgeon's fist around her heart, so it stopped her heart and then she had air leakage between her um, rib cage and her lung that was collapsing her lungs so they had to take her uh, and put her on what's called an ECMO machine which is an iron heart and lungs outside of the body which is the craziest thing as a parent like a to robot. see yeah your child like without you know their chest raising up and down from breathing or their chest beating from a heartbeat it's Insane. How long was she on that? I want to say it was about a month, but I'm long probably, time. yeah. She went on the first part of the ECMO machine and then she needed the more advanced part of the machine. She had 23 surgeries uh, All total. for heart and lungs or? Um, for her lungs, for her heart, um, mostly for her lungs. Her lungs were very damaged from the drowning. Yeah. So you got the call 20 minutes later, like what was your state 
like your mental state during the initial part, but then really like for the three months, it sounds like that you weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, in the beginning, when I first got the phone call, it was panic. It was, um, I was terrified. Uh, I've never gotten a phone call like that before regarding my children. And then to sit on that for 20 minutes, just trying to get to her, it was just terrifying and all I could do was pray. Um, just pray and pray and pray. I passed the cops on the way. I didn't know that until later. I passed her ambulance um, on the way and didn't know that until later. And at first I thought, you know, it was just like a fall. Like she broke something and like she had to be taken to the hospital and I had no idea it was that severe. Yeah. So then you find out, you mm -hmm. get there, you find out they're all gone. Mm -hmm. So now how do you, now you know what happened, right? Uh, no, well I, I figured that she had fallen in the water. Um, everything was just happening so fast. There was a detective that was there and my son's actually the one that found her. So he had, he had my son. Um, and just told me that I needed to go with him to the hospital. Um, but at that point on, the only thing I could do was just keep, keep moving forward. Like, there was no thought of what if, it was just now what? Like, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna keep moving forward? And they had told me I needed to plan for her funeral a few times and it just, I didn't let that happen in my mind. It wasn't like, this is it. So did you, you never really got to the point of like, it was over in your mind? No. You always thought she was gonna pull through? Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's normal? Or do you think that like, that was just a, like you can't explain why you felt that way or like? I don't know if it's normal or not. Yeah. I'm not. I've not really talked to many people that have been through the same situation that my family's been in. Um, I think that it was healthy because if I would have stressed on, oh gosh, now I need to plan for the funeral and stuff like that, it would have all been wasted energy and my daughter needed me and my son needed me. And being pregnant at the time, my unborn baby needed me uh, mentally there. So. Yeah my time was spent in other things than worrying about what if she dies. So then when she, three months later, mm -hmm. she was released from the hospital, mm -hmm. like did you believe that that was the end of it? Like that it was in the clear or were you, did you have in the back of your mind like, were you nervous that it was gonna, you know, come back around? Like how, how were you when it was all said and done? Um, so when she was released from the hospital, she still had blood clots in her, um, one of her arms and one of her legs. And so I was uh, trained in giving her shots every day to help um, stabilize the clots so they didn't travel and get smaller, I guess. Um, so there was a worry about that being long term, whether or not the blood clots were going to stabilize uh, but her recovery, um, I believe she was fully recovered. Yeah. Yeah. So you left the hospital like, all right, like this is behind us. Yeah. And we're going to be all right. Yeah. And how was, how was Rayana? Uh, like, did it change her? Um, she's feisty. She's always been feisty. She's. Uh, been determined and I believe that's what got her through. I don't think it's really changed her at all. She, after she got out, she wanted to go back to the pond. Really? Um, she, I have a picture of her in the hospital. She was so upset she couldn't uh, take a bath. And so as soon as her chest had healed up, um, we got her in a bath and I have a picture of her where the water's all the way up to her nose. She's just fully submerged and uh, she, it's, I didn't want it to be a crutch. So the yeah. whole time I just, 
instilled in her that she was strong and that this was, you know, a blessing and it wasn't a, it wasn't something to feel scared about or, you know. Right. Um, so she loves swimming. She still doesn't know how to swim. We're working on that. But, uh, yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Like, all of this happened in a really short window of time. Yeah. So let's just go, like, you introduced story number two. When did it happen? What happened? Story number two. Um, after Rayana was released from the hospital, we decided we were going to go on this family um, vacation and just travel around. You and um, the kids? Yeah. yeah. Well, me and, and my kids and then my daughter's, my youngest father. Okay. Um, and so he's from this area and he used to live in Cooley City. And so we decided we were going to go to um, one of the RV parks over by Banks Lake. And the kids loved it there, so I ended up re enrolling them in school. And uh, we had family that came to visit us. Um, Yakima is pretty chaotic, and we wanted to get away from Yakima, but family from Yakima ended up finding us and um, caused havoc in our town. And so. The cops ended up showing up at my house, and uh, I knew they had warrants, and I wanted them away from the house, and so I told them, get in your car, we're going to go across the lake. And there was a free campground across the lake. So th I let the kids go out and play at the water. I'm trying to explain to these individuals how to get out of this town, back to their town, and um, go to get my kids back in the car and I'm waiting for them to get back into their car and um, I thought maybe they were at the water but uh, anyways I look to my right and there's this truck driving full speed towards us and this guy's running out of the truck and he's yelling that we had better have a gun and I look across from me and these individuals are running towards me with um, generators from that campground and so I decided to just drive and um, as I'm driving they caught up to my car and they popped the back door and jumped in it's a van so uh, at the same time the victim jumped into my van and they started fighting in the back of my car and he got punched out of my vehicle and guns went off and um, I just took off and it got reported and I ended up going to jail over it and losing my children over it and going to prison over it. So that was, when did that happen? That was September of 2019 when that incident happened. So a few months after what happened with Rihanna. Yeah. And how long did that like from the moment that that all happened to being in prison like how quickly did that happen um so i ended up getting picked up in november of 2019 and i ended up getting out of prison november 2020. okay so it was a couple months from like the incident to when you and the kids like got split up right yeah did you know that was coming Oh, I figured. Yeah? I definitely figured. So like, um, what, were, what was your mindset set in the two months from that moment to like when things actually had, I'll call it a resolution for lack of a better word. I was angry, um, scared. I'd never been in that kind of situation before. Um, and I also just wanted to get it over with and out of the way. So having the combination of those feelings daily just ultimately just sucked. Um, I woke up almost every morning wishing that the cops would already get it over with and come for me, but at the same hand, I didn't want to be in that situation. So it was just a mental struggle. And when I finally got picked up, I was relieved. 
really? to finally get on that path and get through it. And like, were you talking to your kids the whole time or were you keeping it to yourself? Um, well, my kids were with me uh, all the way up until I got incarcerated. So um, they were a part of it. They were directly a part of it. And they knew one of, one of the boys that ended up showing up at my house uh, was left behind. So it was a matter of like, well, was he okay? Is what's going on with him? And just um, my kids were directly affected by it. And uh, the day that I got arrested was the hardest day of my life out of all three events. Um, watching my children be torn away from me and um, not being able to do anything about it. And knowing that if it only was different, if it only hadn't happened, it was hard. Yeah, did you have a bunch of like the, if I had done this this way or if I oh, had yeah. done that, like reliving it over and over and over again? Yeah. All the, yeah. Um, all the way up until I took my prison sentence. So you took what? Until I took my prison sentence. Mm. Um, that's when my mentality switched. COVID happened right. in the middle of all this. And originally my plan was to take it to trial and I felt like I could have won. Um, I was guilty of being there I was guilty of driving the vehicle and leaving the crime. There was things I was guilty of, but what I was being charged with, I was not guilty of. And I felt like I could have won taking it to trial. I was supposed to go to trial in February. And uh, when COVID happened, it stopped all trials everywhere. And so each month it was a continuance. Well, we'll see what, happens next month and eventually um, CPS ended up getting a hold of me and telling me that I needed to make a move that if I um, didn't do something something quickly that I would lose my rights to my children permanently and so I took my charges so that I could keep my children which is just you think they would make an exception Right? Yeah. Like, or you would hope they would. Well, with COVID, everything was winging it. Even yeah. with CPS, they've never dealt with this kind of situation, you know? And so I think it was, they didn't know what to do. And so it was just this or that, what are you gonna do? And I chose my children over my reputation. Mm. Maybe for the sake of, of context, what were you charged with? Specifically, I was charged with robbery in the second, theft in the second, assault in the second times three, and four reckless endangerments. Okay, and all you accepted all those. Um, I, because I took my plea, they dropped the theft in the second and one assault in the second, I believe. Okay, and then so when your kid, like when you got split up from your kids. Mm -hmm. Did you have contact with them? What happened to them for that year-ish, year and a half? Um, I didn't have contact with them until December was finally when CPS allowed it. Um, and so it was emotional. Um, all they wanted to do, we do, we do what's called cuddle puddles. And so that's like all they wanted to do. And it's not the best place to do a cuddle puddle in a jail, but um, that's Weird. what we did for two hours every time. And it was um, every other week. And then when I moved to prison, prison didn't know what to do with COVID and visits. So they just stopped visits from happening. And so I had phone contact with my kids. Um, I think it was once a week. 
And at first, my three kids were together, and then um, my daughter, Rayana, was separated from her brother and sister. And so she floated around through foster care, um, which was, I think, more traumatic for me than her. Um, mm. Every time I got a phone call that she was moving, it was like, all I wanted to do was get out to her and wondered like what she was going through, what, how she was feeling, and I couldn't talk to her about it because she was going through this new um, transition, and it was it was difficult. So she went through I think um, close to seven different homes. Yeah. In a year. In a year. Wow. And like individual family homes yeah. or like group type homes. Um. So there was like three three families that were my family that took her in. Um, and then it was foster homes, which are family homes, yeah. not group homes, yeah. Um, but yeah, foster families. Okay. So why did she get split and the other two didn't? Uh, I hate to say it, but I blame it on my husband. He had told her that if she was bad to her brother and sister and her caregivers, that she would end up go, being able to come home to him, which wasn't the case. He, um, he, the reason why we left him in the first place was he was abusive. And so he um, put his hands on my son and was fighting charges on that and ended up going to prison because of it and so she had this false sense of I get to come home to a parent if I'm bad and so she started fighting with everybody she started punching holes in walls kicking holes in walls and doing all these crazy things and ultimately to get let down yeah 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 that's a lot of transition in a really short period of time yeah so <clears throat> When you got reconnected with them, like when you got out of, of prison, I'm guessing they were still, like you got out, but they were still in foster care or in a placement. Are they still, and they're still working to get them back? Like, how much has that changed since you got out till now? Um, well, I have, I have Rihanna back. She came home May, May 12th of this year. Um, Ladarius comes home this weekend on the 18th, and my baby comes home July 29th. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I got out and I just did anything and everything I could. Um, I had like nine different requirements from CPS for me to do, and I got them all completed. Um, I'm still doing a few of their requirements, but it's like weekly or daily check-ins for UAs. Um, but other than that, like everything's been checked off the list and housing and a job and um, yeah, it's, it's been a journey, but just perfect perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna, for sake of our time, go to the next story. Okay. which was story number two in the timeline. Story number two. Um, so it's about your dad. Mm -hmm. What happened? And when did it, when did it happen? <clears throat> um, my dad was murdered June 8th of 2019. So like right a little bit after Rihanna got out of the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. I actually found out... Um, in Cooley City, there's spots that don't have Wi-Fi or signal, and so we were on our way back from, uh, I think, Euphrata or Moses Lake, and um, my signal finally kicked in, and I had all these messages on Messenger. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then there was one that said, I can't believe he was killed, and I was like, what is what's going on? And um, so I found out that, yeah, he was murdered. It was a pretty big, um, it was called a massacre, actually. Um, 
he um, had gotten a phone call from my cousin that my cousin needed to go somewhere. And there was this guy that had a trailer and a motorcycle. My dad was into motorcycles and wanted to know if he'd take him out there. And so my dad took him and um, when they showed up, there was someone who answered the door that didn't belong there and um, said that the family was sick and couldn't come out. So they ended up leaving. But from what I understand, my dad didn't buy it. So we went up the road to the neighbor and talked to him about it. And the neighbor ended up going back with him. And the second time, when the neighbor went towards the house, went to the house, the door was open and they could see people dead. And so when he had turned to go back to the truck, the guys had followed him out to the truck and um, shot that guy right there in the front yard and then went to my dad and um, shot him in the face. And my cousin and the other individual that was in the car, um, my cousin got shrapnel in the side of his face and dropped to the floor and started pushing on the gas and she got in my dad's lap and started driving the car and come to find out um, in the reports there's I think six or eight victims but um, there's 18 there there's a body count of 18 from like border of California all the way through to White Swan so, how, so your dad was not related or associated in any way with like the situation. He just was the victim of circumstance. Yeah. Which is brutal because it's like, well, you just like daughter circumstance. Now your dad's circumstance. You circ like. It doesn't seem fair, right? Like, did you? Like when that happened, you were still like, I'm sure recovering or just like on the up and up from the Rayana situation. So then like, what was the first thing that came into your mind when you heard that or got back like to be uh, actually face it, I guess. I thought, I guess what I thought was that like, most people go through something hard at least once in their life. And I thought I did when Rayana drowned. And I just thought to myself, why my dad? Which isn't fair because, you know, I'm not the only person that has lost, my, what, lost a dad to murder. But I definitely thought like that was my like hard thing. <laughs> well, I guess the only reason why I thought that was because like, you know, in the news, you hear of all these tra tragedies happening like around the world. And, you know, whether it's groups of people, a nation of people, you just, I just felt like, well, it's crazy. Like I see that this happens, but never, in, in my family, you know, and then, yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's where my thought process came from. Mm hmm Um, so yeah. Yeah. So that's three very difficult situations within a short window of time. Like, when you look back on those things, and or I'll just, even that season of life, we can call it, how have you changed? Like, what growth do you see on the other side of it as a result? I feel like I have a strength that um, God's given me. You know, I thought I was strong before. But then going through those things and, you know, you start off going through them and like with Rayana, I just kept moving forward. But with my prison sentence, it just felt like torturous 
you know, like every day waking up without my kids. And it wasn't so much because like, oh, poor me or pity me. It was my kids that I thought about daily, not just one, three, you know, and um, had to tap into a strength that I didn't know was there. And I know that every step of the way, God has given it to me. Every thing that I have gone through that um, I think he's put this level of protection over my mind and my heart to where it hasn't hardened me and it hasn't broken me. And um, yeah. So how did it change your perspective on like a normal day? Does it change day to day or is it? Uh, I wake up every morning thankful yeah. and blessed. I know I'm blessed. Um, I've seen what it's like to take time for granted. And so I wake up every morning to like strive to not take it for granted. Every moment with my kids, every moment just in general with the people around me, with every task I'm given, um, to do it with knowing it's a blessing to have it. Yeah. You talk about the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about praying when you were you found out about Rihanna, but did where did that like faith that you have in God come from? Did it come from this, or was it um, there before and just kind of like became a significant as a result? Like maybe talk just briefly about that. Um. So I always had a hunger to know. Christianity to know religion or whatever, to know God. Um, from when I was little, my parents weren't believers. And so I would like stay the night with friends and every so often go to church with them the next morning and um, eventually was able to drive. So I started going on my own. Um, my church was very cliquish. And so I had a very bad experience with my youth pastor. And so I decided to walk away completely um, and then as an adult, I started just taking bits and pieces of what I wanted to believe or what I thought was good from uh, different religions or what people, their philosophies and molding myself out of that. And um, that's when I believe the breakdown started happening in my life. I can look back now and I know that that's when it started happening. Um, and um, finding God was through my experiences, these few experiences. And, you know, I walked away. I, oh God, save my daughter, save my daughter. And then, you know, I'll do whatever. I'll be whatever you want me to be. And then got out of the situation and walked away, forgot, stopped being grateful. Um, and then when I was in county, I decided that I was going to put my all into it. It's now or never in my mind. Um, I had so much to lose and I needed, needed God's grace. I needed a miracle and he did it for me once. You can do it again. And so um, COVID happened and they stopped the chaplain from coming in. They stopped all like religious interactions from happening. So I had to get fed however I could find to get fed. And um, there was a girl that came in uh, and her mom was the director of the Grace House here in Wenatchee, East Wenatchee. And so she started telling me about what the Grace House was about and it was religious based and programming. It was all about programming, becoming discipleship program. Mm -hmm. And so March of uh, 2020, I reached out to her and I made sure every month I had a bed for when I got out. I wanted this path and I got out in November and went straight to that house and I've been there since. Mm. And um, it's God sent. If I wouldn't have gone to that house, I wouldn't have found this job either. So it's all by God's grace. Do you think God, like when you look back on this season, do you think God allowed it 
so that you could have the relationship you have with him now? Oh, yeah. 100%? Yeah, I think I don't view my prison sentence or my dad's death or Rayana's um, experience as the same way I taught my daughter. It's not a tragedy. I view it as a strength. It strengthened me. He gave me every opportunity to walk alongside him and I kept veering off, doing my own thing. Um, and all he wanted was for me to lean on him and I can see that because now that I'm doing it, I see what life looks like now. And um, doing it my own way ended me up in the situation I was for prison. You know, all I had to do was just live differently, view life differently, do things differently, and um, yeah. The one verse I learned, my very first verse ever, was um, Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, and that's what got me through, and I still... What is it? <laughs> I'm going to butcher it. It's okay. Um, trust in the phrase. Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in Him all your paths will be laid, made straight. Lead Street, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So that's what I had to do was trust in him the whole time. Yeah, it sounds like it was all you could do. Yeah. Wilderness experience. <laughs> so uh, second question on here was what three words, when you think about your life, uh, best define it? Blessed, forged, and new. Why? Made new. Um, blessed because I've been given chance after chance after chance um, to live like God made me to live yeah. and um, to see life for what it is and to take the opportunity instead of just letting it pass by and then forged I think of um, like knives and swords like when they're made and all of the pounding they go through and the fire they go through um, to be made into the sharp um, weapon they're made into. I feel like that's what God has done with me to make me his weapon. Um, and then made new. Uh, the one thing that I've learned is that all of that doesn't define me. Mm. That it's my choice who I am. It's God's opinion that matters. It's nobody else's. Um, so my life is new. It's not what it was. It is what it is now. Um, somebody else. Somebody's in the middle of a hard season. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Don't sit still. Seek God and counsel. Whatever counsel looks like to you, um, make it count. Make sure they're in a position in their life that you can see that, you know, they're going to lead you on a good path. Um, get out of your comfort zone. I definitely had to get out of my comfort zone in every situation, and uh, it was needed. It was beneficial to do so. If I would have stayed in my in my comfort zone, I would have missed so many opportunities, including this one. So that's interesting because you think by, by definition, being in the midst of a hard thing is out of your comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. So can you explain maybe what you mean by that? Because I think people are going to hear that, and I hear that, and I'm like, what the heck does that mean? Wasn't she already out of her comfort zone? So I think I, under, I, think I can assume what you mean, but can you explain it? So with all of the challenges at hand, I could have decided not to move in the season I was in and just stay stagnant. Um, I had to do a lot of things that I normally wouldn't have done. Um, classes, uh, just dealing with like a bunch of uh, different things that on a daily basis I didn't feel at one point in time I had time for or a need for. Uh, but doing so 
um, has given me a lot of insight and knowledge that I didn't have before. And even though I didn't like being told what to do, um, it, was, it was beneficial. So to get out of your comfort zone, it's like I hate speaking in public <laughs> or interviews. <laughs> But I feel like in doing this, if it reaches one heart, um, one person going through something difficult, then it, it's worth it. So. Yeah. Hmm. So we just kind of talked about one potential way to define like doing hard things. It's being out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might answer it that way. But how would you define, like when you hear do hard things, the life that you've lived and um, experiences you have, how do you think of it? How do you define it? It's one of those dumpers. Well, um, to do hard things is just reaching for what you may think is impossible and doing everything in your power to make it possible. And whether you fail at it or not, at least you did it. It's easy to not try. It's easy to, uh, you know, look the other way or, um, again, sit still. But to, to set a goal and reach for it and know that you might fail at it, it's hard. But it's worth it. Um, so one is you work for a jump rope company. What about jump rope is hard? Like, if you're going to answer that question, how would you answer it? Um, in my life, uh, the hardest part of it, I, I guess, is um, just getting out there and doing it. Um, our challenge is a million jumps in May. and. Um, I have not done my part. I'll just say that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the thought is there of like, oh my gosh, I, I want to, I need to. And I guess that's my, my next hard thing that I'm going to strive for is just being more active, being healthier. Um, I've done all this transformation in my life and all these other aspects and that's the next step. Yeah. That's my next hard thing. Yeah. So, Stay tuned. I'm just playing. <laughs> Episode two.